If you turn now in your Bibles to Romans chapter 3, I'll be reading the first 20 verses. So this morning we'll be looking at verses 9 through 20, and I did warn you last week, this is not a section of Romans that will make you feel good about yourself. It is not a section of Romans that will uh, inflate your self-esteem. If anything, it will deflate it rather quickly. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Let's give careful attention to the reading of God's most holy and infallible word. Then what advantage has the Jew? Or of what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means. Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say, that God is unrighteous to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means, for then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come? As some people slanderously charge us with saying, their condemnation is just. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that, both, that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. One of the things that we as Christians have a bad habit of doing, though we would never, ever confess this with our mouths, is trying to earn God's favor. We try to earn God's favor, and typically what will happen is we'll do this in everyday relationships, and we, that spills over in sometimes what we deal with when dealing ourselves with God. When we've wronged somebody, Somebody who's a friend, we try to make it up to them. We try to do things to earn their respect back and earn their forgiveness, etc. We try to make it up to them. Well, sometimes, even though we may not confess this, we do things in order to make up to God. Look, Lord, I know I messed up here, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this and that to make it up for you. I'm going to earn my respect back. My friends, there's no hope in that. There just isn't. And that is ultimately what our text is pointing us to, is that there is nothing that you and I can do, particularly when it comes to doing our own good works, our works of the law, that can earn favor with God. Nothing we can do. We are concluding here this larger section of Paul's letter to the Romans, which began all the way back in chapter 1, verse 18. So we've spent a number of weeks getting, as it were, to put it somewhat colloquially, smacked down by Paul. 
He has inflicted upon us the spiritual reality and the pain that that spiritual reality brings if we are left on our own. There is no hope. The wrath of God is revealed against heaven and earth. And we conclude this section here in Romans with verses 9 through 20. Paul is essentially going to continue in wrapping all this up to leave no wiggle room out of this. There's no way you can earn your way to heaven. There's no way you can earn God's favor in your life. And he's going to make sure we know it. And he's going to make sure we feel it. And we need to feel that. And my friends, even as Christians, we need to remember this and to feel it. Because otherwise, how would we remember to flee to Christ? How would the lost know to flee to Christ? Why do they need to flee to Christ if they don't realize that they are in sin and under God's wrath? If we just present Jesus as nothing more than a therapist to help us in our needs... Well, great, he's helped me, I'm good, I'm done. But we need Jesus for eternal life, not just for therapy in this life. We've been in this lengthy section. Subsequent to this, and as I mentioned last week, I kind of wish I could just jump into it now. We get the hope. But in order to really appreciate and treasure the hope, we have to understand the hopelessness without that hope. We have to understand the extreme destitute state we are in. That we are those who are rightly under God's wrath and curse if left to ourselves. And so what I hope to show out of these verses this morning is simply this, that all men are guilty and polluted sinners who cannot do anything to earn a right standing before God. All men are guilty and polluted sinners who cannot do anything to earn a right standing before God. We're going to look at this under three headings. First of all, sin's corruption. Secondly, sin's actions. And then finally, sin's hopelessness. Sin's corruption, actions, and hopelessness. So first of all, sin's corruption. Look at verse 9 again. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, for we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Are we better off? Now, the the ESV supplies the word Jews there, and it's probably an accurate understanding that Paul here is speaking of the Jews, mostly because he just talked about the fact that the Jews have the oracles of God. They have God's covenant. They have his promises. So does that make them any better? No, because as we've seen, the mere possession of those things does not matter. They're still lawbreakers. They try to preach. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. And yet they commit adultery. And yet they steal. They're no better off. And so really, Paul now is wrapping all of this up in a not-so-warm-and-fuzzy blanket, but a blanket that is rather unable to make you warm and is awfully scratchy. This is an argument that began all the way, as I mentioned, in chapter 1, verse 18. A lengthy exposition on the problem of sin that we have and what we deserve as a result. You see, the Gentiles, they know God exists because God reveals himself in all of creation, which is why none of us have an excuse. All men are without excuse. All men have no apologetic, no defense for not believing. 
But they also become a law unto themselves because when they do, when they practice the very things that the law requires, they actually show that they have the law of God written in their hearts. The Jews themselves, of course, had this special revelation, and yet despite it, they break the law. They have the privileges, which they basically ignored. So therefore, are the Jews any better off? No, because all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. He's already charged, and the word here for charge could be already accused. There's no way to avoid or to deny that Paul here is now summing up all that he has said, that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. And under here is speaking of that which controls. You see, that's the issue. Sin controls you. If you were left on your own, if God had not shown you grace in Christ Jesus, sin would be the controlling influence in your life. All of us can think of people that we grew at growing up that have been such an influence that moved us in the right direction. And that's, that's all well and good. But at the end of the day, what really controls you, what really has influenced you is sin. Whether Jew or Greek, all alike are under sin. And here, all means all. There's no exceptions. And before anybody can object, Paul lays out verse after verse of Old Testament Scripture to prove his point. He appeals to the Old Testament, and he starts with Psalms 14 and 53. Psalm 14 and 53 start off basically the same about the fool saying in, their, in his heart, there is no God. What we see in verses, the last portion of verse 10 through 12 comes from the beginning of Psalm 14 and Psalm 53. None is righteous. Well, come on, Paul, there's got to be an exception to this. I've seen some good people. I've seen people who donate large sums of money to this charity or that charity. I've seen people help old ladies across the street. There's got to be exceptions here. Paul is emphatic, and really it's the Holy Spirit who's emphatic because this is what the text says in the Old Testament. No, not one. And our temptation would be to say, well, yeah, but what about the time I know not one? None is righteous. There is no exception to this. The Old Testament text there continues. No one understands. No one seeks for God. That coincides perfectly with what Paul said back in chapter 1 where men are described as suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. They're not only seeking after God, they're trying to suppress the truth that he is. And if he's suppressing the truth, how is he seeking him? Now, we may experientially come across people that look like they're seeking God, but they're seeking after something of their own making that will make them feel better about themselves. As opposed to casting all their cares at the feet of Christ. No one understands. No one seeks God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Notice, it's not that each individual is worthless. It's the sum total that have become worthless. All together, they become worthless. I told you I'm not here to help your self-esteem. 
No one does good. And to emphasize the point again, not even one. Not even one. In essence, Paul here is in these few verses from Psalm 14 and Psalm 53, emphasizing the state of man as he is in sin. He is emphasizing his corrupt nature. You see, our problem is not just our actions. And sadly, many professing Christians just simply think of sin in terms of what we do. That is true, and we will get to that in a moment. But sin involves the corruption of our own very nature. And as our confession rightly points out, the Bible sees the corruption of our own nature as itself sinful. We know this in part because of who was allowed to offer sacrifices in the Old Testament. Priests could not serve as priests if they had defects. And that was a picture of just, well, they can't help it. They were, they were born that way. Does that sound familiar? You see, that's a picture of the corruption. They may not have done anything. But we are corrupt by nature. We are therefore by nature unholy. And unholiness cannot be in the presence of that which is holy. So it is not merely our deeds, which we'll talk about in a moment, but our very corruption that needs cleansing. This ought to paint a picture for all of us of our desperate need of grace, our desperate need of Christ Jesus, our Lord, our desperate need of his finished work on our behalf. You see, this is why Paul boldly proclaims the gospel, because he boldly understands and boldly preaches the reality of our sinfulness, our estate, and what it is we deserve apart from his love and grace. So my friends, this may sting. And I'm sure it does. But I'm also sure of two things. One, it probably doesn't sting enough. But secondly, it makes Christ shine that much brighter. We see his love and grace in even greater fashion. And it's because of how sinful we are and we recognize our need for him. But as I mentioned, that this speaks of sin's corruptions. Now we need to speak of sin's actions, the actual deeds. This is our second point. Look now at verse 13. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Now, the beginning of verse 13 is a loose translation or a loose citation of Psalm 10, verse 7. So again, we're still in the book of Psalms, and it's always interesting that people love the Psalms, because, and we should, because, oh, they sing praise to God, and that is true, but they also expose the heart. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is on their lips. That last portion of verse 13 actually comes from Psalm 140, verse 3. Mouth that is full of curses. A mouth that is full of bitterness. The question here as we think about verses 13 and 14 is why is Paul bringing up the tongue? Why is Paul bringing up our words? 
Surely there are sins that are far worse. I mean, after all, remember way back in chapter 1, the abominable deeds that people are doing. The rampant idolatry. Surely those are things that Paul should have brought out there. Well, there's two things about that. First, it really could be said that from a certain standpoint, that there are people that are not doing those abominable deeds, and there are people that are not living in idolatry. But, let's talk about your words. That's what Paul's doing. Is there anyone in this room that can honestly say, that their words have not been used to cause harm to others? Is there anyone in this room that can rightly say that they have control over their tongue? You see, Paul, in his wisdom, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pulls out of the Old Testament specific sins that are unquestionably universal. So yes, he could have picked abominable sins as mentioned in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, giving them over to the lusts of their hearts, exchanging unnatural or exchanging natural relations for unnatural ones. The rampant idolatry. But there is no one, which is why James in his epistle mentions this so often. Why Proverbs mentions it so often. There's no one that does not have a problem with their tongue. And the issue is, as Jesus himself says at the end of Luke chapter 6, out of the overflow of the heart... In other words, out of the corruption that Paul just got done speaking of, so our mouths speak. So our mouths speak. Who dares argue that their tongue has not caused harm? It would be foolish to try to do so. And hence the use of the tongue here. Well, what's the solution? Well, Paul, in his letter to Colossians, reminds us that what we ought to have is the word of Christ dwelling within us richly. That's what we need. If it is true, and it is, if it is true that out of the overflow of the heart so a man speaks, then we ought to fill our heart with good things And what is better than the word of Christ dwelling within us richly? Then your words will be transformed. It's the words of Christ. But it's not just our mouths. Paul continues in verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. That is, they're in a hurry to do harm. Now, verse 15 there, really from verses 15 through 17, you find verse 15 in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 16, but the whole of verse 15 and 17 through 17, you can find in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 7 through 8, which means we're going to come to this again in a couple of weeks in the evening. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In other words, They're in a hurry to do harm to others. We can't wait. We see this in the beginning of Proverbs. Those who are unbelievers, those who are fools, quick, let's set a trap. And of course, they end up falling into their own trap. In their paths are ruin and misery. Their paths being the way of unrighteousness. Their paths being the way of desiring to shed blood. The desire to do harm to others in those paths are nothing but ruin and misery. And apart from God's grace, the natural man will seek this. They will pursue this. 
And the sad reality is we understand, even as Christians, our, our words can hurt. And there's a connection here. Our words can harm and our actions can harm. We can't separate the two. They do not know the way of peace. And as I've mentioned numerous times in other contexts, that the question of peace here is not just simply a truce between opposing parties. But it's a real established relationship to do everything you can to foster that relationship. They know none of it. And in fact, the pretense or the heirs of peace are really nothing more than for selfish gain. Even if it's at the other's expense. The way of peace they have not known. Well, as we come to it, summing up the Old Testament passages that Paul uses, he now goes back to the book of Psalms, Psalms, Psalm 36, verse 1. What is the ultimate issue? There is no fear of God before their eyes. No fear of God before their eyes. You see, when all is said and done, our sin problem, the corruption, the actions that flow out of that corruption, all are a result of an unwillingness, not just simply lack of, but an unwillingness to rightly fear God. This is our fundamental problem. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Feeling good yet? If your answer is yes, you haven't been listening. This is not easy for any of us to swallow. But we must, if we're going to truly see our need of Christ. And we may sit here as Christians, true believers, professing our faith in Christ, professing our dependence on him and think, well, Thank goodness, I don't have to deal with that anymore. While it is true, and we'll speak much more of this when we get to Romans chapter 6, while it is true that through faith, Christ has set us free from the bondage of sin, the bondage of this corruption, the bondage that all these actions entail, nevertheless, the pollution of sin still remains in us. And so the solution is still the same. While we may no longer be under wrath, under the law as a curse, the solution to deal with the remnants and relics of sin in our lives is still the same. It's fleeing to Christ. We still deal with this. The old man wages war against us. But the solution is still the same. Flee to Christ. In fact, brothers and sisters, as somewhat paradoxical as this may sound, the more you grow in grace, the more you see how much of a sinner you really are. I can remember years ago serving on a session at our previous church one of the seasoned elders, when he would really get to know the families, he would say, after visiting them a couple times, you know, after a few years, he would, see, he would ask them, do you see yourself now more of a sinner than you did last year? He's not saying, are you more of a sinner? But do you see yourself now more of a sinner than you realized you were last year? The point being is that as the Lord sanctifies us, he opens us, he helps us to see how bad we really are. And as sanctification takes place and you make progress, you realize in terms of our own holiness here in this life, in terms of our own righteousness in this life, that the the goal was a lot further than we thought. Now we see it even more clearly. It's even further. It's even further. 
Why is the goal moving? No, it's not moving. You just didn't realize how far away it really was. But the solution is the same. The solution is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because in the gospel, we find the power of God for the salvation of sinners like you and me. This is our hope. And we need to know this because at the end of the day, remaining in our sin is a hopeless endeavor. And this brings us to our third and final point, sin's hopelessness. Look now at verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Whatever the law says. Now, our initial thoughts would be to read that expression, particularly the words, the law, and think the Decalogue, or think the Torah, the five books of Moses. But here's the thing, and maybe you notice this, but the series of Old Testament passages that Paul quoted, that, quote, that Paul used, none of them come from the Decalogue. They come from the Psalms. You can argue that one of them comes from Proverbs, so it is also quoted in Isaiah. Nobody had any issues. Those who were either professing Christians or even practicing Jews of Paul's day, no one had any issue with the Decalogue. No one had any issues with the, the Torah. But Paul here is helping us to see that even the Psalms, even Isaiah, the prophets, they too are God's word. They too are holy. They too point us to the way we should live. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. The word here for says, what it says, well, it says here speaks, it speaks. This gets a little bit tricky because some translations use in that second part, it says, or as the ESV has it, it speaks. And it's somewhat split down the middle. Now, this is not a hard, fast distinction. But... When we say something says, it usually refers to the content, the stuff of what is being said. When we're talking about speaking, it usually refers to the actual act of speaking, the deed of speaking. So the question, of course, then is, which is it? Well, one thing that's uh, almost not helpful is the fact that in the Greek, we've got a distinct word for says and a distinct word for speaks. But they overlap. That's the issue. The issue here is the law speaks. The law says something to us. But we've also not just simply focused on the fact that the law speaks. We need to concern ourselves with what the law says to us. What's the content? What's the substance? That's the issue. It's both. Whatever the law says, it speaks. You see, you can't escape it. And it says these things, it speaks these things to those who are under the law. We've already seen this, and actually here it's more, probably more accurate translated as in the law. Those who have the law as a controlling influence. Commentators now here are a bit split as to whether the law here is referring to the law that the Jews have or also to that which the Gentiles have in their heart. In favor of the idea that Paul is speaking to the Jews, they just reference the fact that Paul just got done using Old Testament passages. But remember what verse 9 said. We've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. So it is everyone here. 
everyone. It speaks to those who are under the law. Everyone. And then, as of course, verse 19 continues, it's the whole world that that is held accountable. Paul is giving us a summary. Jew and Greek alike are under sin. Alike are under the law. And alike are held accountable. Notice as that clause shifts, so that or in order that. You see, there's a purpose behind the law saying and the law speaking to us. That every mouth may be stopped. Back when I was in preschool, that goes back a long time, it used to be, this used to be an accepted thing, that if children in class were talking too much, you know what a teacher would do? Put tape over their mouth. Now some of you young folks are like, I can't believe, I've never heard of such a thing. I had tape on my mouth a lot. (laughs) You see, the law serves as that tape for all men, telling you that you have no right to speak before the law. In other words, the law exposes you in such a way that you will have no answer to give. None whatsoever. As your account is read, sin after sin after sin, you will have no defense for what you've done. Your mouth will be stopped before it can even get started. So that every mouth may be stopped, but there's also another purpose, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Held accountable. That could be translated also as held liable to. Uh, It also could be to be tried or to be charged. It's the only New Testament use of this particular word. We find it in other Greek writings, hence the variation on meaning. But ultimately, it has a legal connotation of being charged, being held accountable. And the object, usually, as we see it here, when the word is used in in extra-biblical material, in, in a legal sense, it's used followed by the object. In other words, being tried, being charged, being held accountable either by the one who has been wronged or by the one who was to judge the case. Which one is God? You see, Paul's use of this word here was quite brilliant. Held accountable to God. Because God is both the one who has been wronged and the one who will judge the case. We're held accountable to God. He fits both the one offended and the one who will judge. The law speaks to those who are held accountable by God. And the thing about it is the law teaches us that he's the one who's offended. He is the one who will judge. And it's not just the law, it's the New Testament too. If you want to be narrow in your understanding of the word law, the gospel messages teach this. We are held accountable before God. As we get to verse 20, this wraps up the whole thing in that scratchy blanket. For by works of the law, no human being will 
No human being will be justified in his sight. Now, the, the very structure of verse 20 is, is actually really remarkable. It's clearly well thought out. It could be something like this. It, it, it's really the therefore and the so that gives us the conclusion of the matter. And it reads something like this. By, or more accurately, from works of the law, all flesh will not be justified. They will not be declared righteous by trying to do works of the law. That's the summary. That's what it all boils down to. Whether we're talking about Gentile, whether we're talking about Jew, it makes no difference. The works of the law, as we are handed to them, for those who are, who are privileged by God and His grace to have a copy of God's Word, or those who know what's right and what's wrong because they're made in God's image and they have the law written on their hearts. No works will justify a man. Again, that word justify, as will be spelled out in pretty much the rest of Romans, to justify is to declare righteous. No matter how much you try to do things today, to try to make up to the one that you have offended, to make up to the one that rightly will judge your works, nothing you do will make up for it. Nothing you do will enable you to stand before God and say, here's why you should declare me righteous. I've, here's my list, Lord, of the things that I've done. Well, see, first of all, you can't come to him with a, lit, a, a list because he, through the law, has already stopped your mouth. And as we consider this, we recognize that nothing we do, no action, no deed, no helping of old ladies across the street, to earn our little merit badges, rightly called merit. You see, we cannot merit our justification. Nothing we do before God, nothing we do before God will enable us to be declared righteous because we are not. Then what then is the purpose of the law for us today? Through the law comes knowledge of sin. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. And you wonder why people today in general don't want to talk about the law at all. Because then they might attempt to feign ignorance. Well, I didn't know. Yes, you did. You say you don't know the law? Okay. How will you react when I take your wallet and I take your credit cards and go on an Amazon spending spree? No, you can't do that. That's wrong. Stealing is wrong. How do you know? Because you have the law of God written on your heart. There's no escaping the knowledge of the law. As much as sinners will attempt to distance themselves from God's law, calling it, that's archaic, that's religious nonsense, we can do what we want, yet the law of God is still written on their hearts. This is why all men are without excuse. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. And my friends, this is necessary. And so this is why, if we just take a bit of a step back, but keeping one foot into the topic, why the importance of preaching of the law matters. We preach the law of God to show us our sinfulness so that we flee to Christ and then learn how to live like Christ, which is according to the law. It serves a different purpose. For the one who is unredeemed, it exposes sin. 
It exposes your wickedness. It exposes your rebellion. But to the one who has been set free, the one who knows Christ, who has just cast their cares upon him, who have fled to him in seeking his mercy, then the law becomes a matter of doing what you want to please the Lord. Everything in your power, power that is given to you by the Holy Spirit. But for here, for this purpose, law teaches you what sin is. And even the Christian needs to remember this. How easy it is for the Christian to recognize that while it is true, you've been set free from the bondage of sin. We often forget that the pollution is still there and we need to have that exposed so that again we flee to Christ. You see, this is why Paul is not ashamed to preach the gospel. It bears going back to chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, that is in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous will live by faith. On our own, there's no hope. On our own, we're condemned. On our own, the best that the law can do for us is expose our sin. There's no way you can be justified. There's no way you can be declared righteous by doing works of the law. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's your hope. How can I possibly stand before God as righteous if my deeds simply expose my unrighteousness? It is the righteousness of God apart from the law to everyone who believes. That is, believes upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's our hope. That's where we go. And from the middle here of chapter 3 all the way through chapter 11, Paul expands on this. This is the hope. We thought, that chapter 1, 18 through here, chapter 3, verse 20, that's a lot of terrible stuff for us. That's hard. But now look how large the section is that shares with us the good news of Jesus Christ. From chapter 3, verse 20, all the way to the end of chapter 11, which ends in a doxology that Paul just simply explodes into to give him all the glory through Jesus Christ. This is our hope. This is why Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. This is why all of us should be unashamed of the gospel. Because we who have true faith in Christ experientially know that it is indeed the power of God for the salvation of sinners. What could overcome this? the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what saves. That's our hope. And so my friends, though this passage here in Romans 3, 9 through 20, in summing up what Paul has already been saying, makes us sting. The gospel numbs it. It takes it away. And you can enjoy for eternity life with Christ. Amen. Let's pray.
Our great God and Father in heaven, we do rejoice at your word and what it teaches us. For although the word does often condemn us because we are sinners, and Lord, we don't see it enough. Yet despite this, you have offered Jesus Christ. Lord, may we recognize that you're telling us of our sin, exposing us of our corruption, showing us where we fail, helping us to see that by no works of the law done by us will we be declared righteous. May that help us to see Christ. May your revelation of that be seen by us as a grace because it points us to Christ. Well, Lord, we also ask that you would help us to overcome sin. Each and every day we deal with sin. And may we flee to Christ, even as we did at first when we laid hold of him savingly. We pray all this in his name. Amen.